One, two, three. Just give me patience. Yeah. What? Huh? <laughs> What's up? Z Pack, it's your boy Z Dog MD. Check it out. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm going to pull up your guys' feed today. I'm going to tell you why I'm excited because y'all know that recently we did a show, uh, we did a video sort of criticizing the movie What the Health. And the idea was not to criticize a plant based diet, but to criticize bad science portrayed to the public. And that opened up an entire crap storm everywhere. So all kinds of haters, lovers, scientists, non-scientists, quacks started talking about nutrition. And if we have provoked a discussion on science-based nutrition, then we've done our job. But it got me thinking, look, I've always been a bit of a, or recently been a bit of a low carb guy. Doesn't mean I hate plant-based diets because you can do a low carb plant-based diet. It's more, I have been convinced increasingly by self-experimentation with an N of one and by uh, reviewing the literature on lipids and cholesterol and insulin and sugar that this is probably a route that's gonna work for me and probably a lot of other people, not all other people. But as I reviewed this stuff, I started to realize, you know what? It seems like everything they teach us in nursing school and medical school and pharmacy school about lipids, about LDL and VLDL and HDL, the good cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and how this stuff works is probably wrong or at least incomplete. And the reason we're starting to realize that is that the more experimental data that comes out, the more we start to go, wait a minute, there's something dramatically different here. And sometimes you don't need an MD after your name or a PhD after your name to find a startling insight into the nature of reality. Sometimes you need to look at a system from the outside using different eyes, maybe the eyes of a software engineer. And that's why I'm so excited today to have Dave Feldman, my boy, in the house. Now Dave, and he'll introduce himself better than I can introduce him, but Dave is a software engineer who got ridiculously interested in uh, basically self-experimentation nutrition, and he'll tell the story of why that is, but he's come up with some interesting findings that I think all of us in the healthcare space could learn from, including our crazy studio audience. Check this out. What's up? We got all yes. kinds of people in here today. Look at all our esteemed guests. Ooh. We got nurses, yeah. we got doctors, we got um, interns over at uh, UMC, and we got somebody who works for a snack cake company, which I thought just keeps it moderately to severely real. What do you think, Dave? I love it. By the way, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I just found out that this is your new studio. Is that right? This is Studio Z, and you are our first official guest in I, Studio Z. I am beyond honored. Thank you so much. You're so, welcome. So yes, here's the story. In, in it, about a little over two years ago, about uh, April of 2015, I start a low carb ketogenic diet. I feel better than I ever had in my life. And then about seven months later, I get a bad cholesterol score. Bad. As in, my total cholesterol had jumped up to 329. Yes. So that you gotta understand, guys, that this gives doctors chest pain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> if you're a medical professional, you may want to consider taking a beta blocker because it's about to get worse. I <laughs> bring the noise. The LDL score had gone up to, I think, around 260. Uh, now, this is super, super high levels. Like a typical general practitioner would say, you need to get on statins Stat. right away. Stat. Yes. Right. You need, we need to get you on some cholesterol-lowering therapy as soon as possible. And why? Because LDL is the bad cholesterol. Correct. It is the cholesterol that in the Framingham data, which was a big observational study of a bunch of white New Englanders, said, whoa, every time we see a high, or when we, when we see heart disease, we often will see a high LDL, and by association, therefore, there is guilt, and so LDL is the bad cholesterol. Yes, and so I started learning everything I could about cholesterol after that. And as a software engineer, you know what, I need to turn this off, because I realize a lot of Some software engineer you are, he's like, he doesn't, can't even find the vibrate <laughs> button on his phone. <laughs> Anyways, go on. So as a software engineer, I saw a very familiar pattern. And I stand by that to this day, it looked a lot like a network. The more that I was looking at how cholesterol is handled. Like many people that may be in your audience, like many people like myself, I thought that cholesterol kind of traveled on its own in the bloodstream. It was this own independent marker. 
And when I saw the bad cholesterol, there was something characteristic about that cholesterol. I thought that there literally was different types until I started learning more about it. Mm. Now, as I did, I found out that, no, actually, like all other things your body has a reason to have in the bloodstream that is a lipid, it doesn't mix well with water. Yep. And therefore, it doesn't mix well with blood because blood is water-based, right? So, sure enough, there were other things. Except for Tom's. Tom's is alcohol-based because, you know. Sorry, I'm, science. Go back to science. Science. I, I'm curious what what will actually mix in your bloodstream, Tom. We may <laughs> we may try that. You out know a what? We later. are talking about being citizen scientists here, and uh -huh. uh, you know what better way to do citizen science than to experiment on Tom? Anyways, true. So they don't mix because they, they lipids don't mix. and water. Yeah. So it's actually the genius of your human body that it takes all of the lipids, all the things that don't swim well in the bloodstream, and puts them on the same container. Mm. And that container is a lipoprotein. Lipoprotein, guys, which we learned about when we were first studying stuff and then promptly forgot. Now we just go, oh, LDL, HDL, those are all lipoproteins, right? Right. And yeah. so when they're talking about cholesterol, when they say your LDL is high, what they really mean is the cholesterol inside the low-density lipoprotein, mm -hmm. that's high, is what they say, right? However, this was one of the first things I noticed, and this is probably the toughest part for me to try to get across to people, is that low-density lipoproteins, their primary job is not to bring around the cholesterol. Arguably, their primary job is to distribute the energy you have from fat. What? Yes. So this is what, when I first was looking at your stuff, and the thing is, I, I kind of knew this because I get into lipids and stuff, but it, when put that way, it kind of melts your brain because we're taught, no, these are cholesterol shuttle vehicles, bad cholesterol LDL, good cholesterol HDL, but no, the, the actual real cargo there is triglyceride, it's fat. Yes, triglycerides, tri, as in three, fatty acids. Right. Three fatty acids. So if I'm eating, if I'm on a low carb, high fat diet, I'm bringing in a lot of fatty acids, mm. right? And those fatty acids, they're ultimately going to get packaged as triglycerides and unloaded into this, this boat mm. that's going to be sailing around in my body. They don't just float in the bloodstream. They don't. They yeah. ride share yeah. together. So it's like actually, Uber, except without the really smelly rider. Unless yes. the apo particle is actually that guy. Yes, in fact, you're constantly ordering Ubers in yeah. your gut and in your liver all the time. I would give him three stars because he smells <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, I do have a graphic that I was going to see if I could have him pull up. It's a, it's a bit of a cartoonized version of the lipoprotein. Mm. And so uh, not only have we just talked about the triglycerides, right, which you can see are of a larger predominance, you can see the cholesterol down there, the yellow guys in the bottom left, but also, I was surprised to learn this, there's fat soluble vitamins. There's actually vitamins A, D... D, 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 D stop! Don't tell me the fat soluble vitamins. Hey, interns. Interns, that's it's them. pimp that's time. Right there. There we go. I had one with a pager earlier. Oh, snap. What are the, the fat soluble vitamins, people? Come with it. Speaking the microphone. A, D. <laughs> the ones I mentioned. <laughs> okay, and? And? E, K, K. Yes! Yes! Oh, yes! A, D, E, K, and sometimes Y. <laughs> um, they don't give out those pages for free, people. That's right, people. You got to earn that. You got to earn. By the way, Logan, we, finally the little red lights are coming on to the cameras. I couldn't tell which camera was on. Uh, but, yeah, just a little tech tip, right? You're a software engineer. Oh, yeah, he knows. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. 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 <laughs> so, so I have another slide that I use to kind of give an analogy for people, and it's the it's the boat. If you uh, there we go, the cruise ship. Yeah. So if you think of the boat, that low density lipoprotein is the boat, the LDLP. Then what would be the trigs? In this case, the triglycerides. Triglycerides? It'd be You're the passengers. The homies that are riding the boat. Yeah. By the way, this is the opposite of the love boat. It's oh. like the most, it's the fattiest, greasiest, yuckiest <laughs> boat. That's right. It's, it's <laughs> all just full of lipids. They're just packed right. and just ready to get out of and there, the right? captain is insane. Um, can we go back to that slide, actually? And the life rafts are what? Are the cholesterol. The as, cholesterol. As in, as in, you couldn't say the purpose of a cruise ship is to carry around life rafts. But... You could say it's an important job of a cruise ship. You wouldn't get on a cruise ship that didn't have life rafts. Well, I would because I'm extreme, oh. but most people would not. <laughs> Plus, I can swim at least like 30 feet before, <laughs> I, before I die. Um, so, so wait, let, let, me, let me make sure we impress on people this. In fact, can we go to the first slide that you pulled up, Logan? All right. 
This adorable little slide that you made, Dave, which by the way, as a software engineer, I'm amazed this slide actually is as simple as it is. <laughs> this is incredible. Because uh, actually, Logan, do you have those other crazy slides? At the end, just, this is the slide I pulled out. Oh, I didn't pull them, Z. Oh, it's too bad. Okay. It was insanely complex. So Dave is actually a normal human being. So <laughs> low density lipoprotein is the big boat, the big ship there with the smiley face. And then the triglycerides are the passengers and those cholesterol, the yellow, those are our life boats. And we'll talk about why. And then the fat soluble vitamins are along for the ride because they're dope, A, D, E, K, and sometimes Y. All right, good. Yes. Back to you. So what's happening? Every time those guys are setting sail, in your bloodstream, without question, your triglycerides are gonna be constantly getting used by your cells, mm. constantly. You would be, if you, especially if you're on a low carb, high fat diet. And so, so what do you mean? Where, where are the triglycerides going? These boats are shipping them around to where? Well, they're shipping around to very, very different tissues. Mm. Uh, so of course your uh, adipose tissue makes use of them, your skeletal uh, muscle uh, makes use of them, and also your cardiac tissue makes use of them. Right. The only tissue that can't make use of them is yeah, your brain can't right. cross the blood-brain barrier. Got it. So, and for that matter, they actually, particularly cardiac tissue, loves fatty acids, mm. loves to make use of it, mm. right? Well, if you look, and again, this is me going back to when I started this, if you look at this from the perspective of what's happening mm. the most with these things, it's the triglycerides. They're constantly getting onloaded, they're constantly getting offloaded. The, the lipoprotein actually keeps shrinking in size as it lets all of these guys go. And I kept thinking, well, where does the cholesterol keep dropping off? It turns out, actually, no, most of the time, the cholesterol just makes its way back to the liver. Huh. And that's why I compare it to the life rafts. It's really meant more for things like endocytosis, where tissues in need of the phospholipids and the cholesterol that's contained inside actually engulf the entire thing and make use of it. They pull it apart and make use of it. That's why they're, they're more like life rafts. They're in case of an emergency. <clears throat> so emergencies like you need cell, uh, wall construction that uses cholesterol. You need sex hormone construction, the steroid hormones, they use cholesterol. So those may be cases where that cholesterol is useful. Yeah, the, uh, <coughs> most, most of the time that the cholesterol makes its way back to the liver, um, it can have fates like that. It can, it can be used for bile acid, it can be used for sex hormones, etc. Well, let me ask you a question. So here's where this gets really interesting. What happens if the wall of your blood vessel, the endothelium, the inner lining of your blood vessel, is damaged or inflamed? Well, I'm kind of glad you asked that, actually. Mm. Because uh, there's something called LDLR, the, there, there are receptors mm -hmm. that actually pull in uh, low density lipoprotein. And in the presence of a damaged endothelial cell, they'll uh, actually express more of these. Mm due to being exposed to growth hormone, especially platelet-derived growth hormone. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. Sorry, I had to get rid nerd of the science Nerd stuff, Tom, there. deal with it. Nerd! You're a nerd. Nerd! You're a nerd. We're nerds. Continue. Now, now I'm going to get just a little nerdier still and let you know that there's actually something called scavenger receptors. You may have heard of them. Mm -hmm. Such as like uh, that which connects to modified low-density lipoproteins. And before getting into the weeds too much, the main thing I want to bring back to kind of the 50,000 foot view is the presence of all of these things, again, me being a systems guy, a software engineer that's worked on very deep, complex systems. I'm seeing all of these clues that the body is anticipating all of this stuff. <coughs> it's mainly using the system for energy, but sure enough, if there are cases where, say, you have damaged endothelial cells mm -hmm. due to like higher oxidative stress, higher uh, inflammation. Inflammation. Yeah. yeah then it actually has a system in place that it anticipated making use of to work with it. Right. So again, me being a systems guy, I'm going, ah, wait a sec. Where's the unanticipated problems mm -hmm. that came with LDL cholesterol being deleterious, mm -hmm. being a problem all on its own? Because the narrative I kept getting, and I'm sure you got, mm -hmm. as many other people get, is that it's almost like a mistake of human nature that we mobilize this cholesterol into the bloodstream and then unfortunately some people have a worse mistake than others mm. and that it just seems to be at higher levels. Yet, yet getting back to the low carb, high fat diet, <coughs> if I'm mobilizing more of that energy for fat to fuel my body, it makes perfect sense since they ride share that I would have more LDL particles. That makes perfect sense. But the thing is, so where LDL then becomes interesting is you have damage to an endothelial wall. <coughs> it then gets in that damaged wall gets oxidized, further damaged, macrophages come in, 
you form an atherosclerotic plaque over time. That plaque then in the future ruptures and attracts platelets and clot and you have what they call in the business a heart attack. And the thing about, about cholesterol is it's, n it's a necessary part of that, but one of the theories now is that without the damage to the vessel wall, these ships are just going by and the life rafts never get offloaded or they never get picked up and put into this damaged uh, vessel because there's no need to activate the life rafts. So looking at cholesterol by itself has been misleading over these years in terms Absolutely. of a, a cause of heart disease and, and, and stroke, et cetera. Well, and let me give you one of my best examples, which is smoking, right? Smoking has nothing to do with cholesterol production. It's just awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's just, it's great. It's fun. Definitely recommend smoking, it by the way. It makes your it's teeth look good. I yeah. highly recommend it. Anyways, makes you cool. but makes you cool. Vaping makes Tom cool. Yeah. But it yeah. brings about yeah. oxidative stress, right? Mm -hmm. And so if smoking's bringing around all of these reactive oxygen species, these uh, uh, free radicals, mm -hmm. they're damaging the endothelial cells. That's not controversial. What I'm saying isn't controversial at all. Yeah. The damaged endothelial cells then become problematic to the extent to where it makes sense that the body would take action to repair it. Right. Right. So here's a, here's a trick question for you. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have a hole in your endothelial wall of your blood vessel, or would you rather have some spackle there to try to plug the leak? Yeah. I'm just curious. I'll take the spackle. Okay. And it turns out evolution has provided us with that spackle. It, indeed it did. So the, the, the question doesn't become, should we ever have any atherosclerosis at all? Because everybody watching this right now has some level of atherosclerosis, just like they have some uh, certain number of cancer cells. You shut up. It's true. No. You Please. have some amount of it, they'll find it in kids as early as, um, as, early as they study it, right? One of, one of the seminal findings in the Korean War was that young people were dying and they were doing autopsies and finding atherosclerotic plaque in coronary vessels of 19-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it, so then the question becomes, again, as a systems guy, is there a system in place to handle that? Mm. And clearly there has been to the extent that it's been able to help us out all the way up until around 30, 40 years ago, right? Then all of a sudden we see a lot of this stuff on the rise, especially heart disease, especially diabetes, right? Especially a lot of these things coming together, the, the uh, diseases of civilization. So, so, so now it's getting really interesting because we've reached an inflection point where this adaptive system, and you're describing it as a system because you are a software guy, but a biologist would just say, well, it's this <clears throat> particular organ, uh, neurohormonal, uh, uh, humoral response to whatever. It turns out something changed. Yeah. that made us get ill uh, as a result of this reparative process. And how do you think about that? How well, you and again, I'm gonna sound like a typical engineer. I look at the inputs. Mm. Okay, what's coming into the system? Mm. And how does, how does the system handle these inputs, mm. right? And without question, I saw more and more, whether or not you're a low carb <coughs> person, whether you're a vegan, whether you, whatever you are, mm. there's no question that high levels of insulin is one of the worst things that can happen because it's like a spin wheel of different bad metabolic outcomes, mm. right? So if you're, if you're waking up with high insulin, it, like in a fasted state, you have super high insulin, yeah. you've got a lot of these markers that bring around inflammation. It yeah. certainly can bring around a lot of these deleterious <coughs> effects that we're talking about. Now we have to understand, guys, for folks who are still unclear of, of insulin and the role and how it works. Now, insulin is a hormone that helps regulate glucose metabolism. It's also an, a growth type hormone, so it causes proliferation, it causes growth of adipose because glucose gets put into fat, it causes glucose to be picked up by, by the liver, skeletal muscle, et cetera. It's very, very important hormone, but when we have higher and higher and higher levels of insulin due to most often in the US, type two type di pre-diabetes or diabetes, <coughs> insulin resistance. So there's resistance to insulin in terms of its ability to get glucose into cells for a variety of reasons that they've kind of intimated. And a lot of them also promote uh, inflammation and other problems that then can get into this whole cycle of damage to blood vessel walls, kidney damage, high blood pressure, and a cascade. So you and I agree that insulin, high levels of insulin, often due to insulin resistance, is a fundamental problem and something that changed that, that started creating this epidemic of what we're seeing now. Do you agree? I, I, I try to be a good scientist and say, I don't, you know, there's obviously different possible components. If there's any single large component that I feel convinced is not very controversial <laughs> to say, mm. certainly constant levels, hyperinsulinemia, high 
insulin in the blood on a constant level yeah. is a bad thing, right? Yeah. There's so many things that come with it, and particularly a constant state of inflammation is usually bad to um, anybody who has it. Um, it's, and so, for example, if you're on a diet, um, let's say that you're on a, you know, a carb-centric diet, but it's, but it's relatively low in fat. Mm -hmm. So it does bring up, say, higher levels of glucose, but you have a, f a fine insulin system that manages to shuttle away the uh, shuttle it away into glycogen, and there's not a lot of say de novo lipogenesis that sort of stuff. You're insulin sensitive. You're insulin but sensitive. But you're eating carbs, and you're okay, and you're lucky genetically, and you exercise, and you're active. Right. Your right. energy levels are are in stasis. Yes. Right. And that's really what we keep coming back to is somehow in the form of the diets that we have right now, the standard American diet. Sad. Sad. Yes. We tend to find that there's a hyper palatability that brings around people eating a lot more both carbs and, and fat, fat and especially in very high processed ways especially with things like trans fats so you're just bombarding your body with not just a lot of things that's difficult for it to work with mm -hmm. but a huge load of energy and as i was saying a little bit before we did this without question high energy parked in the blood is always a sign of trouble if you have high triglycerides or you have high glucose yeah. The level of energy parked in the blood being at super high levels means there's trouble down the road. There's trouble. It, it's not only trouble in itself, it's trouble as an indicator of other trouble. Insulin resistance, overabundance of energy right. elsewhere. Uh, basically, the American diet, more or less, can help trigger this, this state. At least that's what we're starting to think is happening. So what's interesting, the, the, two couple, the couple things that I want you guys to really understand from this, and there's quite a bit, but we're going to get a little more into it, is that LDL, HDL, VLDL, these lipoprotein boats, right? They are energy trafficking animals. Yes. Which means they indicate to some degree, because they're produced by the liver, right? And they're upregulated or downregulated by the liver. To, to some extent, to some extent, they are going to be responsive to what you eat in terms of energy in and energy out in terms of what you're using in your muscles. So in other words, they, they they're to some degree an indicator of your energy status. Is that not a good way to think about it? No, and that's, that's why I'm glad you set up that segue. Uh, if we could get to that first graph by chance, um, this is basically kind of central to my research. So this graph, what you're seeing here is you're seeing 29 data points that took place over around uh, nine months. And I, these were all uh, advanced cholesterol tests known as uh, NMRs. Uh, now, and let, let me let me let me explain that. You can show the slide, Logan. So NMR is actually measuring individual LDL particles, whereas right. most most lipid tests that we get in the U.S. in any event and probably around the world measure the cholesterol fraction of LDL. Is that correct? Uh, or are they measuring the apoprotein? No, it, it, actually, most of them don't go so far as to actually measure the particles themselves. A standard lipid profile mm -hmm. is usually capturing just the cholesterol found, right? And even then, there's the Friedwald equation. So it's, it's usually capturing total cholesterol, mm -hmm. it's capturing HDL, mm -hmm. and it's capturing triglycerides, and then it calculates yes. LDL from that. That's right. right. So you're not directly measuring LDLC. No. Yeah, okay. Um, now, to be sure, I can say it's, it's relatively accurate so long as your uh, HDL and your triglycerides are not at super high or super right. low levels. Right. Uh, so my NMRs, as you can see, they're, they're characterized by the blue line. And the axes for that are on the right side. Well, on the left side is just a three-day average of the dietary fat that I had before each of those tests that it's coupled with. So what you're seeing is, with each of these couplings, you're seeing that um, I'm manipulating my LDL-C, my LDL cholesterol, up and down with my dietary fat. So, so let's, let's back up for a second. Keep that slide up, keep that slide up, because I want to I wanna really emphasize this. The orange line is his fat consumption, dietary fat. The blue line that's usually on top is his measured cholesterol LDL-C. Look at the correlations, and it spans in terms of days, two to three days, Look how dynamic the LDL measurement is. How many, go, 
put the graph down for a second, Logan. How many of us in healthcare think that LDL actually is like a hemoglobin A1C in some way? It actually measures what we've been eating for a month or two, and we check yeah. it every quarter or every year, and we think, oh, we kind of know what this person's about. What Dave showed, citizen scientist N of one, and subsequently by getting other people to contribute their data, he's consistently replicated this for the most part, that the lipid system, as he as a software engineer suspected, is a dynamic system that responds to the dietary fat, as we would predict since these are vessels carrying triglycerides, in a, in a way that's really fascinating. First of all, it's dynamic, meaning that you're, you could change your LDL in short order, in three days, by yes. manipulating your diet. Now, how you do that and what it means and this inverse nature of it, I'll let you talk about. Yeah. And, and that's the trickiest part is, uh, first of all, viewers would be, would, I would understand if viewers were saying, well, wait a sec, you're at very high cholesterol levels in the first place. That's absolutely true. That's what got me started on the research, mm. right? But without question, if you control for all the other variables, I controlled for exercise, I controlled for the composition of the food I ate, so mm -hmm. I stayed relatively low carb, high fat throughout, mm -hmm. right? So that the only thing that I was changing was my dietary fat and relatively in calories. So, it would, so my protein and my um, carbs would also kind of go up and down with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, per that graph, the second set, I want to say- Let's uh, throw the graph up, yeah. It starts from data point, um, I believe, uh, from seven up to 14. That actually happened over one week where I was taking my blood, I was drawing my blood every single day. <laughs> so you can actually see those curves. I ate to a diet plan to induce this shift. And that one point where it spikes, where you see my fat spike way high at the very, at yeah, the very right tip. right in the middle, yeah. That was- Day 14. Uh, that was data point 15 where I actually intentionally wanted to step on the gas and say, well, if I eat fat like crazy, I should get like one of the lowest LDLC scores I ever had. And that's what happened. Wow. I, I just ate fat like crazy. <laughs> and sure enough, my LDLC dropped. Okay, l l <laughs> this is why I wanted Dave on the show, all right? Because this data is so counterintuitive to what we were taught. And the fact that what Dave did was in a low carb, overall low carb state, right? You're not eating a ton of carbohydrates. So this, this, and you're gonna tell me what this looks like in someone who's eating carbohydrates at some point, if you have any of that. Uh, well, actually that's, that's the most interesting part. This is mo most all my research has been within the low carb community. Yeah. I'm looking forward to somebody breaking out and starting to do this uh, that's not in the low carb community that might be on a regular diet, which is why I was looking forward to having the, the chance to ask you live oh, no. on camera mm -hmm. if you would like to contribute to this research. It's actually pretty easy to do. Do I have to starve myself because I'm not doing it? That's the opposite. I'm in. All right. Tell me what I need to do. This is what you do. You eat whatever you're eating for three days. Go ahead and pick your favorite meals, yeah. right? And for Onions. The but track them. Yeah. <laughs> track whatever it is you ate. And I want you to double that amount of those exact same things. Yes. For the next three days. I'm in. Gorge like crazy. Take a blood test on that that first sprint of three days. Yeah. And then take a second blood test on the second sprint of three days. And I predict right here on camera that Z Dog's LDLC will go down on the second test. Let me immortalize that. Let me, so again, let me just tell you guys, like he is saying you can eat, the more fat you eat or the more overall energy stasis is the theory and he's seen it in himself and in others. The more fat you eat, the lower your LDLC goes. Now, here's what we didn't explain. Why? Okay, yeah. so here's what it comes down to. What's the theory anyways? The, well, yes, the patterns observed, this is the theory behind them. It's actually kind of an Occam's razor theory. Oh my God, Occam's razor. Uh, I shaved my back with that, by the way. Very sharp. <laughs> you do? Yeah, is very it good? sharp. Oh, it's smooth. I'd like to get it on order, but. You know what? Amazon, I'll give you an affiliate link. Okay. Yeah, anyways. Simplest razor there is, y'all. <laughs> Science, I would what? expect it. Hit me, Logan. Uh, Occam's razor! Razor, 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 razor. <laughs> so the gist of it is, if you're eating a lot of food, and particularly the fat that you have coming in, mm. right? The fat's coming in, it's getting packaged into what's known as chylomicrons. Your body is aware of it. And, and let's say that I don't even identify exactly what systems are in play. Mm. Let's just say your body's aware that you're in a state of abundance. You're right. eating a lot of food. Now, you, and, you know, I want to clarify something. You said chylomicrons, so you guys have to understand when fat comes in from the, body, uh, from the GI tract, it gets turned into chylomicrons, which are these 
sort of storage of vesicles. It's a, it's a type of LDL. Yeah. It's a type of low-density lipoprotein yep. that comes exclusively from your gut. Got right. it. Okay. So when a lot of those guys are incoming, mm -hmm. your body's going, hey, we're in a state of energy abundance. We don't have as good of a reason to bring out as much from storage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're not going to have as many of the VLDLs, and that's the counterpart to chylomicrons. You have a lot of chylomicrons. There's not as much reason to bring out the VLDLs from storage, the very low density lipoproteins. They mm. come from the liver. Mm. Right? Liver's making those de novo. Right. Yeah. Now, let's turn it around. Let's say that you're <coughs> not eating a lot. Mm. Mrs. Dog has talked you into a diet, and now you're, you're going to be bringing down the total calories. So there's less that's coming in that are chylomicrons. Mm -hmm. What does your body do? It goes, well, we, we still need a certain amount of LDLs uh, in circulation. We need enough triglycerides anyways to feed... Yes. Yes. So it brings out more of the VLDLs, right? Now, why is this important? Because the chylomicrons, they expire quickly. They go away in a matter of minutes to hours, right? Got it. The VLDLs, these guys go for days. Mm. Well, when you take a fasted cholesterol test, it's 12 hours later, yeah. what's happened to your chylomicrons? They're all gone. Poof. What's happened to your VLDLs? They're still chilling. They're still hanging. Yeah. Therefore, you're just watching all that's happening as the cholesterol becomes a marker because it's ride sharing yeah. with your energy from fat. It's become a marker for what's coming from storage. Ah. Therefore, if I'm eating a lot, I'm suppressing my body's instinct to upregulate the energy from storage. And you know what? Can't emphasize this enough. It's why I wanted to emphasize the energy basis of the system. Cholesterol is not the driver, it's the passenger. Cholesterol is along for the ride on a larger energy metabolism. That's it. So <clears throat> let, me, let me tell you guys a little Z-Dog tip here. Uh, I call it the, the Feld Dog tip. <laughs> so imagine you want to suppress your bad, bad cholesterol for a health insurance exam. Uh, no, a, a life insurance exam. Most people will go, oh, I'm going to starve myself eat really, cr you know, nothing, and just uh, hopefully my cholesterol will go down and it'll be awesome, right? Wrong. You are going to spike your LDL because VLDLs ultimately can, can you know, it, it, and LDL are directly related, right? Um, and as part of the, the cycle, you're going to actually spike your LDL because you're going to need energy and your liver is going to help produce it, right? The liver's kind of the pilot of this whole thing. It's actually much more important than we were led to believe in terms of energy metabolism, right? And so as a result, if you were to gorge, this is what Dave's point is, if you were to gorge on fat for the three days prior to your test, you might see the lowest LDL that you would otherwise see for the reason that now the body thinks, oh, you're totally energy replete. You have all this energy. Why make VLDL? There's all these chylomicrons and fat coming. That's, that's the general gist yeah. of the theory behind it. Now, to be fair, uh, most of this research, I would say it's had about an 86% success rate right. of those people who've tried it. And uh, virtually all of them are inside the low-carb community. So it's possible, but I think unlikely, uh, that this applies to people on a low-carb, high-fat diet. But I doubt it. On a, sorry, on a, so, so, you're, so the question is, does this only apply to people on a low-carb diet? high fat diet or can we broaden it to people on a high carb low fat diet or a Dean Ornish vegan diet or something like that so we need more data points that's correct now this is where I have always said there is no one size fits all that's why Dave is a citizen scientist with an N of one who now has a network where he's getting more N because other people are doing the Feldman protocol which I'm pretty sure you're gonna post uh, at some point for us yeah you can just go to my blog at cholesterolcode.com I actually have a write-up um, we'll share that link. People to look at, and of course, we have to emphasize this is you know not this does not constitute medical advice. Uh, it's really more something that's been an experiment that many of us have applied up to this point. I will say though that I have had uh, seven people uh, that have actually specifically done this who were on a low carb high fat diet who had high cholesterol numbers that have used my protocol and have successfully lowered their life insurance rate. Right. Uh, by dropping that LDL. By dropping the LDL, which is why I think in, at the end of the day, what might actually propel this into more of the mainstream mm -hmm. is people actually using it to hack their life insurance if that's how it ends up 
happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the life insurance will get savvy and they'll start measuring something else, some other proxy. Well, at the point where life insurance says we can't count on this number anymore, I'd consider that a major victory. That's a major victory. Finally, they would start looking at yeah. it for what it is, which is, for my opinion, an energy-based yeah. system. And here's the thing. Engineers like Dave don't look at statistical data like Framingham that establish this correlation between LDL and coronary disease. They don't look at it the same way doctors do. Doctors look at this stuff and they're like, oh, correlation, yeah, this must be it. LDL's along for the ride, it's a bad guy, it's the bad cholesterol. But there's actually not a lot of mechanistic data to support that and increasingly we're starting to think it's more complex than that. And it's work like yours that's actually shedding light on this. Now guys, we could actually dig into the weeds of this stuff so deep uh, if you guys want Dave to come back, because we want, we want to talk about what is a, a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. What is a low carb diet? How does it relate to the fact that Dave lost, what, 35 pounds? Yeah. And you're an endurance athlete. Uh, nah. He's I, humble. Yeah, I, I do distance running probably one half of the year. Yeah. Uh, but because of my research, I've actually had to enforce being sedentary oh. so that I could control for the variable. I, let me actually interject like this real research. quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I actually, I anticipated it would affect my lipid numbers, yeah. and it has. Yeah. The times in which I was doing distance running, yeah. my cholesterol numbers dropped by a margin. Yeah. And I was not surprised by this at all. It dropped the largest margins, mm -hmm. based against my inversion pattern, of anticipated levels when I had the most uh, soreness. Ah. So again, cellular repair, yeah. endocytosis, takes them out of the blood. Takes that LDL out. Creates a, a confounder. Cholesterol out. It's interesting, and, and one thing we were talking about before is my own experience with a ketogenic diet, which I did for eight months, was that my cholesterol went from around, my LDL-C went from around 86 on my normal diet to about 165 um, on a high saturated fat diet. Yeah. And uh, I measured particle count as well, and that was pretty high. Then as I started losing weight, I, I lost more and more weight and I lost all my, and like, because what happens on a ketogenic diet is you're actually- Got ripped. You get ripped. Got ripped. Because you're burning, what's happening is you don't have a lot of glucose, your insulin levels are really low, so the body goes, hey, where are we going to get our energy from? It's almost unlimited. It's called fat, son. Yeah. So I had a six pack. I started losing fat in my neck so that I actually developed a little click when I swallowed, like real adipose loss, and by, by the way guys, this is another topic, but adipose itself, fat, is an endocrine organ. It releases all kinds of stuff beyond fatty acids. So that all being said, what I noticed was in that lean state that my LDLs were going up, my particle yep. counts were going up. Now what's your explanation or theory or behind that, why that I, might be? Are we gonna go there? We're we gonna get to that geek level? I can. I could do that. If it, you can do it succinctly. I'll, I'll, we'll I'll try to do it succinctly. Yeah, yeah. I actually have a blog post on this that came out, I want to say, last month or the month before. And there's a, a profile I like to call. So what we've been talking about to this point is hyper responders. That's what it's called within the low carb community. It means people who really bump their lipid, their lipid uh, tests when they eat a lot of fat. When they go low carb. When yeah. they go low carb. Typically, yeah. they, we call them uh, hyper responders. Well, there's a term I'm now using I like to call lean mass hyper responders. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that I see the highest levels of LDLC mm. in, right? However, along with high LDLC, their HDL will be 80 or higher. Sometimes I see them in the hundreds. Mm. Um, and their triglycerides will be 70 or lower. And sometimes I see them in like the 30s or 40s. Mine was 30, yeah. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. think about this. Think about this. You have this high level of energy demand mm -hmm. coupled with lower glycogen stores in your muscle and your liver. And, and just to clarify, glycogen is where glucose can be stored in liver and muscle, and they're kind of parking spots that you can fill up pretty quickly, and then the spillover glucose gets turned into fat. Right. Yeah, so please. And the other part is you have lower adipose tissue. So you have these, these two tanks that aren't topped off in full. So no glycogen, no fat. Less right. fat, less glycogen, yeah. Less, less, less glycogen, yeah, less fat. And in that sense, you, you don't have as much staging ground on the adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. Because as we got to talk about, we won't get too geeky and in the weeds, but there's a little more with non-esterified fatty acids, with distributing it, just distributing the energy back out mm -hmm. um, is, is those fatty acids. There's basically more necessity for the system to mobilize the fat specifically 
mm. and low density lipoproteins because there's not another alternative ah. to the same degree, yeah. to the same degree. So you're gonna see the energy carrying function of LDL accentuated. You're gonna see more LDL right. because there's really not another great way, there are, but I mean, it's not as much glycogen from glucose or adipose sitting around. Right, now, it's really worth pointing out that as scary as these numbers may sound to somebody who's traditionally into you know, cholesterol and concerned yeah. about what may be happening to the system and that this is such a fringe thing, mm -hmm. inflammation markers are just at the bottom, right? You've got like CRPs of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 for these athletes. You, you've, got, you've got AST, ALT at the bottom. You've got amazing CMPs. So, <laughs> guys, so just so you understand what he's saying, and again, this is one of the things that Many doctors, many nurses were going to be like, but your cholesterol is so high, you're going to yeah. die. And what did I say in the beginning of this? Without inflammation and damage to the vessel walls, without that high insulin See, can you move your yeah, iPad, move, please? Move your iPad. It's My like iPad right in, in front of your face. <laughs> <laughs> We've been trying to get your attention. It's been bothering for like, me and Logan for yeah. like a half hour. Now. Want, <laughs> right there, right there. Why don't you just say that <laughs> instead of there you go. not saying that. I thought you would notice, there. man. I don't notice these things. You're looking at yourself, Z. What the hell? I'm beautiful no matter what's hiding me. In fact, the more stuff's hiding me, the more beautiful I am. <laughs> I hate you guys so much. Anyways, so without the damage to the vessel wall in terms of inflammation, in terms of high insulin state, you can have circulating cargo ships filled with triglycerides and cholesterol that never offload their ish. Well, yes, they need to be, the low density lipoproteins need to be modified. Mm -hmm. So, so the, <laughs> let, let, me, let me simplify it. Early on, early in the research, I was like, look, there seems to be three things okay. that everybody agrees is problematic. See, can you lose that? <laughs> I hate you people. I'm going to put it down here. It's my only connection with the Z-Pack. You put it in the aim shot, man. What are you doing, Come man? on, bro. Okay, who's more important? <laughs> All right, let's just ask this question right now. Who matters here? Uh, it's Dave. <laughs> so it's gone. Go for it, brother. You heard it. You yeah, heard it. I, I you said heard it. it first. So inflammation, oxidative stress, endothelial damage. Right? Say that again. Inflammation. Inflammation, oxidative stress. To the LDL particles or the plaque itself or the... Or they would say to the, yeah, to the LDL particles yeah. mainly, right? Yeah. And endothelial damage. Right. So these three, these three things are highly associative and probably mostly overlap to each other. Yeah really mostly come down to the endothelial damage slash dysfunction. That's the scene of the crime, yeah. right? The, the thrombosis, it's coming up here. This is where the problem started, yeah. right? And what it comes down to is I thought when I first saw my high cholesterol numbers that within an hour, I would find, given how sure everybody seems about high levels of cholesterol, that that's all I would need is about an hour to, to find the study that goes, yeah, yeah, see, we, we already showed it, it's right here. And I was stunned to find that the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis is still actually a theory with regard to high levels of concentration. That's because those three things have never been controlled for. Yeah. If you know these three things are highly associative, especially the third one, especially yeah. endothelial dysfunction and damage, mm -hmm. you need to, when you do an experiment, you need to go, well, we controlled for that. And with that control, we changed this, only this one other variable, which is total concentration yeah. of LDL. And see if you get, and you have to look over years and that's why we're stuck with things like Framingham, which is a large observational cohort study, right. because we don't have the capacity. Who's going to, who, which pharma company is going to fund a trial that says, maybe you don't need a statin for an LDL of 165. Right. Right? Well, it gets worse. Are no. You, are you ready for the big mind-blowing moment? Come with it. Let's go full conspiracy. This is where, this is where the inversion pattern I'm telling you about on this show could change everything. This sounds like something on Alex Jones' show, doesn't it? Yeah. This inversion pattern that I'm about to explain to you yes. changes everything. You've been a hospitalist, right? According to the what the health vegans who think that doesn't qualify <laughs> me to talk about nutrition. <laughs> yeah. Answer me this, this multiple choice question. Which is more likely that somebody nearing the end of life is going to have a lower than average appetite, an average appetite, or a higher than average appetite? Someone near the end of life. Okay, I think I know where you're going with this. Someone who's dying is probably going to, I always see that they have a lower than normal appetite. They're not eating. Right. Yeah, they're, they have cachexia from either cardiac or cancer, COPD, 
End stage whatever, renal disease. Right. Ah, oh, I see where you're going with this. So if you've got a lower than average appetite. Look what he's doing, people. Listen carefully. Even, even not counting all of the helpful effects that your body may be upregulating LDL particles for. So for example, in binding to pathogens for immunological response, which we didn't even get into. Setting all of that aside, if you have less incoming energy because you're nearing the end of life, your body has a good reason to be upregulating more energy. And if you're upregulating more energy and cholesterol is coming along for the ride, I would expect there to actually be a higher association with LDLC and all cause mortality than there is right now. <laughs> Listen carefully to what he's saying, people. We talk about correlation and causation. We talk about association. What Dave is saying is that a lot of times in people who are uh, at end of life or whatever, the LDL might be higher because they're eating less, they're in an energy deficit state. And so when you study those guys, you go, look, their LDL is high, therefore it must be causing them to die. Now one, now one caveat to that, in very sick patients in, who are septic in the ICU, who are really in the process of acutely dying, often young people, we see an acute drop in LDL. Right. Now, how might you think about that, or is that something that's off your data set? It, it would, I would say it's off my data set. It's mm -hmm. why I would like, the, the very first thing that I would like is for somebody outside the low-carb community to falsify my pattern. Yes. Like, that's a that's, good sign. That's a, that's a legit challenge is please have a nice controlled experiment where you actually can determine if this inversion pattern do, can be observed outside of it. The most recent experiment that I have is I got a lot of people at a keto, keto fest, which was a... Uh, that's a thing? It's a, it's There's a thing. There's something called keto, keto fest? fest? This was last month. Oh my God, dude. I got 23 people to uh, take the test of getting their blood drawn. Uh, this was with the help with PTS diagnostics. I got to fit in them real quick. They actually paid for all of this. We got all of our blood drawn on a Monday morning. Everybody pigged out on fat God, all throughout sounds the like weekend. The best thing ever. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Sure enough, on the Monday morning following, 20 out of 23 people had lower cholesterol than the Friday experiment. So now, the, but now again, we have our data set, which is low carbers. Low carbers, right? Which right. is why I want to get outside the low carbers. Right. And, I, and while I theorize that this would apply to everybody who's, in, who's metabolically healthy or doesn't have some yeah. other derangement that might which, be impacting it. Which will definitely, yeah, it could, could definitely tweak stuff. Yeah. That I would bet that it's probably close to the same general average. That might be around 85%, mm. something like that, that this pattern applies to. But we won't know until we actually get studies. And I, I don't think cholesterol-lowering companies are going to be anxious to get this out there. That's my belief. It doesn't sound like a, a high on the agenda. No. Yeah. But now, you know, one of the interesting things is there is evidence that, you know, statin use does improve, you know, some outcomes in, in terms of cardiovascular, particularly in secondary prevention and that sort of thing. I mean, what might be, is it a different mechanism than LDL lowering? Well, here's where I have to give you my big, big freaking beef. What I get very angry, honestly, whenever I get a study put in front of me that shows me cardiovascular outcomes, especially when they use events. Mm -hmm. when events can have any amount of arbitrary decision-making on the part of the person who... Let me give you a simple example. You and I are in a study, right? You have low LDL cholesterol. I have high LDL cholesterol. We see the same general practitioner. Every time I go, he goes, Dave, you really should get on a statin. You're, these numbers don't look good. You're probably going to have a heart attack at some point. He sees you. He's like, what's your secret, Z-Dog? How do you get these amazing numbers? Whatever you die from, I know it's not going to be a heart attack. First of all, I'm amazed he's talking to either one of us because he should be just clicking boxes in the chart. But anyways, go on. <laughs> Fair so enough. he loves my numbers. He hates yours. Right. Yeah. We both go and eat at uh, uh, Echo and Ridge. That's a fantastic it's a great restaurant. Place. We all love and it. And by the way, we want, to, we want some free coupons, Echo and Ridge. <laughs> yeah. You hear me? What? What? Off the strip, son. Pour it out. Don't pour it out because we mess up our table. Anyways. We have a big steak dinner. Eat exactly the same things yeah. and part, part ways. And both of us experience an intense chest pain for 30 minutes, right? I go, crap, this is it. I check myself into the emergency room. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay, my lipids are great, bro. You take, you take a I'm Tums. I'm gonna take a Zantac. And sure enough, you know, a little bit later, it dissipates. Right. Both of us in this example had a myocardial infarction, right? <laughs> it's just non-fatal. The difference is, is I went. Yours gets measured. <laughs> yeah. EKG, EKG catches me, right? Post-cardiac <laughs> enzymes, it's all there. Oh, here's the catch. Both of us are in a study. 
So you see how cholesterol has a self-reinforcing feedback mm. loop. If we're both in a study, there's nothing that automates. This is why engineers, we have a problem with these nutrition studies especially. Nothing automates both of us going to the hospital given a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. Because unless we have EKGs built into us, mm -hmm. it's our decision as to whether or not we go. I'm, right? I'm, and again, I'm gonna get personal for a second. So when I was opening Turntable Health, I stood in our lobby there in downtown and there were like 200 people, including the mayor's office and all these people, and I had to give a speech. I was two months into a ketogenic diet. I had checked my LDL, it had gone from 80 to 165. And I started having intense, substernal, crushing <laughs> chest pain. Like literally like, Tom, like an elephant was freaking sitting on oh, my chest. Man. And I remember thinking there, I had my kid there. There's pictures, you can see of this online. I remember at that point while I was talking, we're cutting a ribbon and all of that. I'm gonna die right here in front of all these people. They're gonna laugh at me for going on a ketogenic diet. And they're gonna be right, because I'm an idiot. And I was very close to telling my wife, just call 911 because I need a ride. Yeah. And I didn't because it slowly started to dissipate and I blew it off. And I, you know, I'm a, at this time I'm a 40 year old dude, middle-aged Indian male, like high risk for everything just because. And I'm like, I'm dying, that's it. It's acute, like something's happened. And so that is exactly right. That's the way we mentally think about it. I would have been much more likely to go to the ER than if I knew my lipids were still 80 and I was you know, eating the, the standard you know, recommendations, which for me were leading to a hemoglobin A1C that was high, yeah. <laughs> you know, all these yeah. other things. I, well, and I've, I've unfortunately had to deal with the same thing. Naturally, here I am, I'm pouring over symptoms of angina and all these different things mm. in learning as much as I have about lipidology. And uh, this happened recently because I like to play poker as well. Oh, we're in, we're in, in Vegas. Las Vegas. We're in Vegas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had this one tournament where I got a little bit deep into the tournament. Mm. This is after I'd gone keto. And I got really nervous and I really kind of felt it a little more on my left side. And naturally, I'm going, oh my God, and I'm checking my, I, my, I, uh, my Apple Watch. No, my, my heart rate seems to be fine, a whole bunch of other stuff. And I texted a friend and I said, I'm really concerned because I, I don't know that I've ever had this before. And he sent back screenshots of all the times during playing during the WSOP where I was like, oh man, my heart's beating right out of my chest. This hand is so intense, ah, right? Yeah. The so difference is, attention. yeah, mm -hmm. I got scared yeah. by knowing, this is why the feedback loop yeah, feedback matters. Loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It matters because until you can control independently of what people's opinions are, mm -hmm. of what their health is, and again, we have further problems. That also spikes cortisol. Yeah. That basically, <laughs> it's going to be a, yeah. your placebo show, yep, right? Yep, yep. All of this stuff. All he of this stuff. He watches the show. It's I do. Yeah. It's a good show, by the no, way. No, and it's a self-reinforcing cycle. And this and this is the pro this is the problem with nutrition science. Period. Period. Yes. I agree, hundred percent. That's why shit like what I'm sorry, we're not supposed to curse on against medical advice, but it's I just garbage. Did. Crap, like garbage, like what the health? Where they're citing all these nutritional studies, they're all flawed for this for many reasons. So you can't use it. Look, if you want to go on a low, uh, a low fat, plant-based diet, great. Get data on yourself, understand the physiology, if it works for you, wonderful. But don't make up, you know, look at these horrible trials and then act like they are the God's word. Because for all the reasons you're saying, they're not. Well, and this, is, and this is why I usually don't tout any particular trials because, yeah. as I like to joke, Dave's standards are just too high. Sorry. I, there, <laughs> when it comes down to, if you look at the experiments that I do, if you, look at, if you look at my history, you see that I actually uh, literally take a picture of everything I ingest since I started my N of One it's study. It's true, I right? saw some of these pictures. It's, it's By insane. By the way, you eat great, like a big old piece of burger with cheese on it, yep. two of them sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I, no bun. But I track all of that, and a lot of people are like, wow, you're so dedicated, you're so, this is gonna be like the best data ever, and I think it's barely mm. adequate. I think that's like barely enough for what it is that I feel should be there for nutrition studies. <laughs> Which is why, by the way, if I get my study at some point, I would like to do a formal study on, on the inversion pattern. I want it to be a ward study. I want yeah. to provide the food. Yeah. I want to be sure of all of the measurements. Mm -hmm. I want to record all of the participants actually taking the food. Yep. And I want to have the uh, phlebotomist on site. Yeah. And, and, and that may sound over the top. Control all the elements. That's exactly and it. And put, put them in a bomb calorimeter and <laughs> them just measure everything. That'd be great. By the <laughs> way, Tom, now you know when you're playing poker with this guy, his tell is he grasps his chest like he's having a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking. I'm like, you tell, Dave. we just killed his poker face. He's that's like, right. well, we know Dave's tell. To, to add to it, if you see me checking my watch a lot in a kind of panicky <laughs> way, 
<laughs> hey, so Dave, we got about five minutes before the show turns into a pumpkin and the feed cuts out. What's actionable <laughs> for normal people? You know, how can you take all this and, and distill it down? True that. Well, s certainly one thing that I would really want to get across to viewers is if there's anything in my research, whether you're a low-carb person or not, if there's anything you should be able to take away, it's that the lipid system, that which carries around your cholesterol, is highly dynamic. It's very dynamic. And if you go to my site or if you check on any of the uh, research associated with what I'm doing, it's there's lots of people, not just myself, lots of people who now uh, follow cholesterol code, and they also have been changing their lipid numbers at a very rapid rate. Now, that said, it's also important to understand that it's an inversion. So if you are uh, lowering the total amount of fat you're eating, or for that matter, if you're doing multi-day fasting, coming up to a cholesterol test, I have strong reason to believe, even if you're not a low carber, that you're actually spiking your cholesterol numbers. I know how unintuitive that sounds. But it actually is something we've demonstrated over and over again for those people on a low-carb diet. So truly, if there's anything that I wish everybody knew, it's that they could at least not make a lifelong medical decision based on a single annual cholesterol test. To me, that just, given everything that I've learned up to this point, that to me is just insane. Suck it, Big Pharma. <laughs> uh, on that note, Dave, I really want to thank you, brother. Thank you so this much. This was so much fun for me. I mean, and we nerd out, you know, because we're crazy nerds. And the thing is, we're kind of focused on low carb, but we can broaden it. We're going to get guests on talking about other types of diets. But the idea that citizen science works, that look getting an outsider perspective in terms of engineering works, the fact that you're personally motivated to do this because of your family history and other things that put you at risk for coronary disease, to self-experiment and then let your knowledge spread to the world, that is huge. And it's folks like you that make against medical advice live up to its name. So thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll get you on again. Peace, CPAC. We love you. We out. Can I just say something real quick? Dave Science, the shit out of y'all, motherfucker. <laughs> oh, I'm not supposed to swear on this show. He's gonna be so mad. Bye. I hate you so much, Tom. Just give me face.